the Elgin Cultural Arts Commission, the Grand Victoria Foundation, the Grace Burstead Foundation, the Courier News, and the Illinois Department of Commerce and Community Affairs and Senator Steve Rauschenberger. Why do we love downtown? Maybe the historic buildings and landmarks touch our collective memory and remind us of who we were, who we are, and who we can still become. Perhaps our civic buildings and religious institutions remind us that we are a community, connected and interdependent. Or maybe it's just that downtown is still a public place, a commonly owned neighborhood that belongs to everyone. In Elgin, Illinois, downtown was once a vibrant hub of activity with theaters, shops, and hotels, all catering to a prospering city. As Elgin grew, so did its downtown. And soon, Elgin became a retail center for the entire region. But then the physical landscape changed, and nearby shopping malls lured the anchor stores away. Slowly, Elgin's downtown, like many others, fell on hard times. The city tried to save it, but those efforts failed. Downtown was no longer a destination, but a place to be avoided. A few years ago, Elgin began a revitalization program. The ambitious plan presents a renewed vision for downtown, but more importantly, offers a glimpse into the city's culture. A culture that adapts to take advantage of new opportunities and works together to solve problems like a family. Where does this culture come from? How does it survive? Well, to understand that, you'd have to know the story of the Elgin National Watch Company. The first American watch factory began in Waltham, Massachusetts in the 1850s. Adapting current day technology, Waltham used precision machinery to make interchangeable parts and mass produced pocket watches. Word of Waltham's success quickly spread and a group of Chicago investors talked about forming a competing company. The group was led by Benjamin Raymond. Benjamin W. Raymond was a merchant capitalist who came west from upstate New York in 1836. He was twice elected mayor of the city of Chicago, and his investments branched out into the outlying area. He was uh, instrumental in bringing the first railroad to Elgin because he was a director of the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad. Raymond knew the company would only be successful if he could hire skilled craftsmen to build machinery for the new factory. People look at the, at the watch factory and think that the watch is the primary product of, of, the, of the factory. But the primary product in that factory is the machinery. The machine tool industry was just beginning to evolve, especially at the level of precision and accuracy that watchmaking required. And the people that knew how to do that, to build the machines, to build the dies, the cutting tools, and so on and so forth, they were at Waltham. That was the source of the talent pool. Raymond began corresponding with employees from Waltham and found there was interest in the new company. So he moved forward, organizing the National Watch Company of Chicago in August of 1864, with himself as president. The company would be headquartered in Chicago, but a location for the factory was still undetermined. Raymond, with long-standing ties to Elgin, offered the town an opportunity. Uh, back then, in 1864, just as is true today, uh, companies usually want some incentive from the community before they locate a plant there. Uh, the conditions for Elgin to receive this new watch factory was uh, the gift of 35 acres of land 
and the subscription of $25,000 worth of stock. The town located a site for the factory, just along the banks of the Fox River, but couldn't raise the money to buy the land. Then, four investors stepped forward. In company lore, they are called the Four Immortals. Lawrence and Pease, as well as Henry Sherman and Sylvanus Wilcox, were four men who stepped forward and uh, provided the 35 acres of land for the Watch Factory site and uh, raised the $25,000 in stock subscriptions necessary to attract the industry here. The company now needed craftsmen to build machinery for the new plant and hired seven of Waltham's finest giving each of them an annual salary of $5,000, an acre of land, and a $5,000 bonus. In 1864, a typical wage, uh, full-time, for a factory worker is about $600 a year. And the incentive of $5,000 bonus, plus an acre of land to come west, attracted some of the most skilled craftsmen from Waltham. These skilled craftsmen were the seven stars in company lore. The new factory also attracted local workers, with many coming from nearby farming communities seeking good wages and clean work. All this put pressure on a tight housing market, and in 1867, before the first watch was ever made, the company built the National House, directly across from the factory. And the National House, or Nations, was known here in Elgin, became a community institution. It was, for many workers, it was their first introduction to Elgin. They lived there as single people until they were able to, or until they married and had a home of their own. It's really um, amazing to, to think about. Um, way before the Settlement House movement and Jane Addams, uh, Elgin got his own settlement uh, house and, uh, uh, through the company, uh, a place that gave workers you know, opportunities to, um, to socialize, uh, their families to congregate, uh, and, all, and all of that builds you know, uh, cohesiveness within a community. So it really marks a community in a very different way. It makes a community different. Operated at cost, the National House would eventually grow to accommodate 350 workers with a dining room that provided 1,500 meals a day. Later, the company expanded the facility by adding a gymnasium with a second floor ballroom, tennis courts, and a practice hall for the famous Watch Factory Military Band. After two and a half years of planning and preparation, Elgin released its first watch movement, the B.W. Raymond, named after the company's first president. Public acceptance was immediate. The B.W. Raymond movement was the company's flagship model. Size 18, very big. They call a full plate movement on the back. In other words, it was solid. You, can, you don't really get to see the gear mechanisms. It was wound with a key, like a little clock would be. The movement refers to the uh, uh, moving parts of the watch, the gear train, and that mechanism. Movements would be shipped out to jewelers, and so would cases. And the customer would go into the jewelry shop and select the movement they wanted and select the case and the jeweler would combine the two together. It was very common to refer to uh, products by their source of origin. The original name of the company was the National Watch Company of Chicago. By 1874, however, uh, people were beginning to ask for the watches made in Elgin, or Elgin watches. And so the company changed the name to the Elgin National Watch Company. Growth in sales meant more expansions of the plant, and the company doubled the size of the original factory. Then, in the mid-1870s, Elgin took a bold step and cut prices, gambling that lower prices would increase demand. That allowed them to capture a larger market share by virtue of a lower price. It also put, com put the competition back on their heels. The competition had to slash their prices in order to match Elgin. That cut their profit margins, which weakened their position in the market. The gamble had paid off, and the company enjoyed a growth period that lasted into the early 1890s. Floor space was doubled, with several additions to the factory, 
three-story wings on the south and east, and small towers on the front. By 1891, Elgin had surpassed Waltham, accounting for 60% of all domestic watch sales. The workforce grew to over 3,000, and unlike many factories of the day, half the workers were women. The watch factory was a good place for women to work because women had nimble fingers, could work with those small watch parts. Um, it was a clean place to work, and it wasn't, it wasn't heavy labor. Because women were able to earn a good living, and a decent wage at the watch factory, uh, families were able to purchase homes, which created a middle-class environment in Elgin. As the fortunes of the company went, so did the fortunes of Elgin. Population tripled as workers came from all over the world to fill jobs at the factory. The company payroll became a mainstay of the local economy, and downtown business boomed, especially on payday, when streets were jammed with workers. The growth of the watch company also sparked a construction boom. 1,200 homes were built between 1890 and 1892. New schools were built, and existing ones enlarged. A new city hall was opened. Churches also sprang up, like the new Universalist building. As a tribute to the burgeoning industry, the Universalists designed their structure in the shape of a pocket watch. But the good times wouldn't last. The financial crisis of 1893 was looming, and Elgin and the watch company would soon feel the crunch. The Panic of 1893 sent the city of Elgin into a tailspin. Several businesses closed, and the city's five banks faced small runs. Then, in the summer of 1893, the unthinkable happened. The watch company laid off half its workforce. When the company finally emerged from the Depression, they were determined to cut expenses and invested in labor-saving machinery. New automatics could replicate tasks done by as many as 25 employees. Threatened workers walked off the job. It was during this period of unrest that Charles Holbert took over as president of the company. Holbert, a reformer with a progressive management style, would set the tone for the company and Elgin for many years to come. One of the first things that Holbert did was to have a meeting with the union leaders at the National House. And then came a whole series of changes. Holbert increased wages and shortened the workday, opened a company infirmary, and introduced one of the nation's first pension plans. In 1909, the National Civic Federation recognized the factory as one of the best places to work in the country. The name of Charles Holbert became synonymous with Father Time. All the presidents of the Elgin National Watch Company, beginning with Benjamin Raymond, lived in Chicago, one of the Chicago suburbs. But Holbert was the first one to make frequent trips out here to Elgin, walking down the narrow aisles of the plant, uh, talking to workers. And many of them felt that they uh, could talk to him if they had a a personal problem. The improved labor relations paid off financially, and in a style typical of the Hulbert administration, the company reinvested earnings in greater productivity and broke ground on a big new factory. The, the whole layout of, of the building was number one, it was monstrous. Uh, number two, it was very impressive to me when I saw it the first time. The new factory's dominant feature was the clock tower. 144 feet tall, it was the first ever self-winding tower clock placed into service. The dials were 14 feet across and were automatically lighted. The time could be read day or night from half a mile away. The watch 
tower was something very special, not only to the employees of Elgin Watch, but to the whole city. The Elgin National Watch Company had reached a point in its history where it needed to show to the community that it had reached a certain level of greatness. To show that the company was successful, they needed to create a symbol. And you always had that at the back of your mind, saying, yep, the clock tower is over here in our community, which means that's where the big factory lies. That's where Elgin's greatness has come from. It, it must have meant a great deal. Um, for a city of that size, you know, to have had, you know, that kind of imposing landmark, um, being such a powerful uh, statement, right? Um, economically powerful, socially powerful, visually pleasant. I mean, what more does a small community want? Yeah. Another investment was made when Elgin became the only watch company to maintain its own observatory and began timing watches by the stars. It was uh, directed by the Bureau of Standards that all manufacturers of watches and clocks pull in their tolerances because they were having a few too many train collisions because the engineers' watches were not exactly on the same time. So when this directive came out, the Elgin National Watch Company decided that they would really go all the way on this and they built their own observatory, their own timekeeping observatory. At the observatory, staff astronomers would choose a star whose position was known. Looking through the eyepiece of the telescope, the observer would see cross lines made of spider web. Each time the star crossed one of the spider web lines, the exact time to one hundredth of a second was recorded on a specially designed chronograph. For many years, they brought their Lord and Lady Elgin watches up to the observatory, and they would take the, the Lord and Lady Elgin watches and make their final adjustment. And then they'd hang that little tag on it that said, Time by the Stars. And it was a fantastic merchandising gimmick, really. It was wonderful. Life in the city of Elgin became more enjoyable between the turn of the century and the First World War. In 1910, Elgin was home to the first of nine national road races. These events brought tens of thousands of visitors from all over the country to witness the daring and dangerous spectacle. The watch company donated a silver trophy for the main event. Downtown became a mecca for entertainment with the arrival of vaudeville and motion picture shows. Retail business also grew. Sheely's Grocery had now become one of the largest in the Midwest, and customers came from all over the region to shop at Peck's, Ackerman's, and Swan's department stores. On Friday nights when I was young, it was like the loop to me because the streets were so crowded. And in fact, people came from as far as Rockford and from uh, southern Wisconsin to shop in Elgin because they knew they were homeowned stores and they knew that the people would give them good service. And, the, and actually, the clerks in all three of those stores were absolutely wonderful. As Elgin flourished, a new movement in city planning was sweeping the country. The City Beautiful movement, an effort to reform the urban landscape, found support in Elgin and led to the development of the city's extensive park system. Former watch company executive George Lord donated land for a park on the city's east side, while Wing Park, on Elgin's west side, was home to the first publicly owned golf course in Illinois. Most of the great public places in America are products of the City Beautiful movement. And the, the City Beautiful movement was so pervasive in its influence that, uh, that it was literally everywhere. And you can see it in the historic photographs of Elgin. You know, the classic Roman campanile in the tower of the Elgin factory um, was exactly the kind of thing that was being done during the Beaux-Arts. And, you know, if you look at the composition of, of the Elgin factory, the window bays are carefully designed to be beautiful. The doorway entrances are decorated. It, in its own way, it's a very beautiful building. 
leadership at the watch company promoted the philosophy of City Beautiful. In 1917, President Hulbert funded the first Elgin City Plan, providing a guide for the community's social, aesthetic, and economic development. A driving force was uh, the Elgin National Watch Company and, and making that happen. And, and the Elgin laid out some of the same kinds of things uh, other cities did, but how, how, where the growth would be, where, how the street transportation could change, the idea of neighborhood parks was introduced in the master plan, and, and it was just to make the city more beautiful, more livable for all of us. I think in part we, we start seeing the um, confidence that, that uh, this community by that time has in itself. Um, and to even make such a bold statement as the 1917 plan, a confident uh, community, a community that came from somewhere and, and uh, has reached a, a point of, of growth and, and uh, um, pride and, and to, um, to begin to look at um, things in a much grander uh, fashion. But the master plan was never fully realized, and as America entered the First World War, interest in the City Beautiful movement waned. During the war, the watch company worked at full capacity to keep up with demand. And when American soldiers returned home from battle, they were sporting a new kind of fashion, the wristwatch. Prior to the war, wristwatches were worn primarily by women. The concept of a man walking down the street in 1910 wearing a, wearing a bracelet watch, as they would call them, would absolutely be uh, uh, absolutely unheard of. It'd be like a man in 1910 walking down the street in a woman's gown. But the war changed the way men viewed the wristwatch. It was now linked to the soldier, a rugged man, heroic and decisive, eager to take action and make use of the latest technology. Elgin took advantage of the new trend and entered a period of unprecedented growth. Wristwatches opened up this a whole new market segment because people replaced uh, their pocket watches with wristwatches. Elgin was particularly attuned to the uh, opportunities of the wristwatch, and they moved into manufacturing wristwatches earlier than the other American companies. Production in Elgin rose to one million movements a year, double that of Waltham, now riddled with labor strife and financial crisis. The Elgin company was taking advantage of the void created by these problems in Waltham and increasing the production, selling watches, and getting into the wristwatch business, which uh, Waltham was very, very slow to accept. Uh, not only was Elgin the primary producer of watches, long surpassed uh, Waltham, but of the more than 14,000 retail jewelry stores, only 12 did not sell Elgin watches. Fine jeweled watches needed regular maintenance, and only a skilled technician could work on an Elgin, so the company established the Watchmakers College. The college attracted students from all over the country and provided training in watchmaking design, repair, and retail management. Many graduates left to open jewelry stores of their own, remaining loyal to Elgin and stocking display cases with Elgin product. To keep up with demand, the company expanded the plant again. Old sections were demolished and new sections added the entire complex grew to over 21 acres of floor space. Well, no other watchmaker in the world had anything like it. There was the National House, uh, the Planetarium, the uh, Watchmakers College. Uh, it was literally a, a, a watchmaking complex. As Elgin began manufacturing the smaller wristwatch, the parts themselves shrunk in size. The screws alone were so tiny that 20,000 could fit inside a thimble. The work was precise and tedious, with employees spending hours at a time handling the minute parts. You had to use a, um, an eye loop. Uh, 
You couldn't do it with just your ordinary vision. Well, I worked with, the, as I remember, you know, with the, this little black eye glass, you know, one eye fastened around your head, and, uh, and then you had a light hanging over there, shining right there, and that's, that's what you did all day. The whole movement of that watch is smaller than that fingernail. And you, you take that movement out of the case and lay it on there, and, and uh, you could still see your nail. That, that, that small. Uh, that's your little finger, not the bigger one, the little one. You sat on this high stool, and you loaded the first machine, and you pushed yourself to the second and to the third, and then you gave a shove, and you went all the way back to the first, and you did that for eight hours. And so the middle of the morning, I would get up off of my chair and go out to, into the ladies' room and get everything back where it was to be because my socks, my stockings were all twisted. Now we made, well, escape pinions, balance dads, third and fourth pinions, I don't know, too many of them. We'd run out two, three hundred pieces an hour on the machines, too. The company improved the fringe benefits offered to workers. A new pension fund was established in 1918. The following year, a relief fund was set up, including health and life insurance. Part of the, uh, the, the Halbert program in the 1920s was to encourage employees to buy stock. And the company uh, stock just took off in the 20s. So many of the workers did very well, both in dividends and by capital gain on their stock. To oversee many of the new benefits, the company established an employee advisory council. Made up of representatives from each department, the council became a sounding board for management. It also organized athletic leagues, social events, and published the Watchword magazine, which read like a small town newspaper. Yeah, that was one of the uh pleasures we waited for was the watchword every month. And uh, in it, they would have uh, reporters from each room who would report on what certain people did. Couldn't wait to get them and, and read them. And, look, and then there, there was one page of cartoons, too, which was real good. But uh, so you, you read them right away and uh, maybe over again. I avoided company propaganda, how good the company is. My theory was that if you showed a lot of people going on vacation, new automobiles, they were making good money. So that's good company propaganda. I find, for example, amazing uh, the um, experience of the magazine that the factory um, promoted and that, that that actually then was run by the people themselves without really interference on the part of the owners. People supplied information about their own families, about events, the birthdays and, and other such events, very personal family events. So people would learn about others, they would learn about their work environment. It was a virtuous relationship, a virtuous partnership, probably the best that one could hope for, in fact, between an economic enterprise, you know, settling in a place and uh, uh, contributing so much to the civic growth of a community. As the company expanded, so did Elgin Center City. The atmosphere in downtown was electric. Well, it was a beehive of activity, downtown Elgin. And of course, sales were bolstered by the paychecks of the Elgin National Watch Company workers. And when the watch factory would get out, the people would walk right up the street. They didn't, no, you didn't see any cars that people took over. And if you were coming the other way, you got off the sidewalk because they came out in droves and just beat it right up, uptown.
They never use the sidewalk. They walk, they use the whole damn street to walk up to, to town before they got on the sidewalk. Just coming down in droves, you know, to cash the check and shop, me included. <laughs> well, actually, it was just kind of an accepted thing that most of the factory workers would have a credit. And so they'd head down to maybe buy a new dress or new shoes. I mean, every payday meant that they were going to be purchasing something. The stores in downtown Elgin were department stores. There were movie houses, uh, shoe repair places, uh, independent dress shops. It was, a, it was like uh, putting uh, two or three mo modern malls all into a three or four square block area. The explosion of downtown was followed by a surge in car ownership, and the city of Elgin responded, paving over 70 miles of roadway between 1922 and 1931. But the project was costly, and soon the city was mired in debt. What happens is that uh, you, you get this tremendous amount of construction in the 1920s and this all, all the energy that had gone in previously into the Beaux-Arts movement and the, the creation of beautiful public monuments and public spaces after uh, the First World War is put into the project of uh, retrofitting American towns and cities for car use and we get this tremendous amount of uh, highway building and you know the ro the streets all had to be retrofitted and furnished with traffic signals and stuff tremendously uh, costly uh, project. The 1920s were the most successful period in the history of the Elgin National Watch Company, but the domestic industry as a whole was losing ground to the Swiss. By the time of the Great Depression, only five American watchmakers remained. And watches being luxury items, of course, were one of the first things that people cut back on when the Great Depression of the 1930s hit. That meant that the effects of the Depression in Elgin were actually exaggerated over what they might have been in other communities. As the Depression deepened, company stock plummeted to less than $6 a share, down from a high of 70. Then there were massive layoffs at the factory, and the work week was cut in half. The watchword magazine was suspended, and the company dismantled the National House. By the 1920s, the National House was showing its age. And in addition, more and more workers were driving their automobiles to work instead of taking the streetcar or walking. And as a result, a parking lot was more needed than a National House, and it was raised in 1932. Federal money kept the city of Elgin afloat in the 1930s. Residents found much needed employment as a number of civic projects were launched including a new water treatment plant, a National Guard armory, and new bridges at Chicago and Highland Streets. A federal grant helped transform Walton Island into a well-manicured public recreation space. The company experienced a short recovery, just in time for Elgin's centennial celebration in 1935. 3,000 employees were restored to full-time work, and the watchword magazine returned to publication. Then, as America prepared to enter the Second World War, the company received a contract to develop mechanical time fuses. Two years later, the entire watch industry converted to full-time war production. The watch company was 100% towards the war effort. They produced no civilian watches. All oh, various timing devices, uh, aircraft box, uh, arming devices for the ammunition, and etc. But uh, uh, quite an array of different things. All precision. Timepieces whose function is so vital that sometimes the destiny of battle fleets has depended absolutely upon their accuracy. But World War II was a double-edged sword for the company. On one side, the military contracts gave the company a much-needed boost in sales, especially on the heels of the Great Depression. The other side of the sword, though, was that they abandoned all domestic production, and that allowed foreign competitors, primarily the Swiss, 
to capture a larger share of the American market. While most consumer goods were subject to rationing, watches were among the few items that could be purchased. The Swiss, free from any wartime restrictions, pumped over 30 million fine jeweled movements into the U.S. Another yet to be uh, not really apparent uh, trend was that it allowed the U.S. Time Corporation, who was making fuses and other timing devices for the military, to get a good financial footing. They used that footing to become the Timex company of the 1950s. Timex turned out to be one of Elgin's major competitors. When the war ended, the company returned to domestic production. But the loss of market share to the Swiss and the development of the revolutionary Timex would soon spell disaster for Elgin. After the war, demand for American-made watches soared and Elgin, with its great brand name recognition, saw sales increase. To keep up with demand, the company opened a plant in Lincoln, Nebraska. The Lincoln plant was a modern building. It uh, had as much usable floor space as a plant in Elgin. Uh, we employed about 4,000 people, and half of them were on watches, and the other, maybe about 1,800, were on government work. So we carried that on out at our Lincoln plant also. Continuing its time-honored tradition for innovation, the company announced the development of Elgiloy. This tough new alloy was used for the mainspring of the watch and would never rust, never break, and never grow weak. Elgiloy was indestructible and would survive under the fiercest conditions. Company salespeople began pitching the new product as the DuraPower mainspring. Soon afterwards, Elgin celebrated a landmark in watchmaking, completing its 50 millionth movement, the most ever by a manufacturer of jeweled watches. But despite Elgin's success, the Swiss dominated the U.S. market, selling comparable watches at a lower price. 90% of the cost to produce the watch is in labor. It costs $12 for Elgin to produce a watch. It could be produced in Switzerland for $3, $3.50. That's why Elgin uh, appeared before the Tariff Committee and the United States Congress for years. We didn't want anything overprotective. We just wanted the tariff laws to state that it would compensate for the lower wages in foreign countries versus American wages. Some relief came when President Eisenhower raised the tariff on foreign imports, but it lasted only two years, and by that time, Elgin was facing a more formidable competitor in Timex. Timex had an enormous impact on the U.S. market. They were building a very low-priced uh, watch, very reliable. Our engineers assure me that this Timex is fastened as securely as possible to this propeller, the propeller of this powerful outboard motor. Now, we're not. Timex watches were marketed for their extremely durable nature. Of course, they were rugged, that's true, but being a non-jeweled movement, they would only last for a couple of years. But at $10 a watch, you could afford to throw it away when it broke. Well, imagine this Timex, this Timex, yes, there it is, this baby stuff. And only Timex, with its exclusive V-Conic movement, can take such a licking and keep on ticking. One more reason why more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world. Management didn't realize that Timex was going to make such a, a big impact. And uh, when it did, it hit hard. Although the watch company was struggling in the 1950s, the period marked a renaissance for the city of Elgin. Residents enjoyed a strong sense of pride in being associated with the company. Elgin was recognized all over for its watches, you know. It put out a product that was 
something that everybody could use, you know. And they were all over. Well, I think we just kind of took it for granted because it had always been there. It was just uh, a part of your life and part of the city's life. But I know when you would travel anywhere and you mentioned you were from Elgin, they, oh, yes, that's where the Elgin watches are from. The company had provided Elgin with a shared experience for nearly 100 years, and everyone in town had some connection to the factory. If it wasn't their dad or their mother, it was an uncle or a cousin or an aunt or somebody, somebody out of the family would be working at the watch factory. If uh, your neighbor didn't work at the watch factory, his brother-in-law did, or his sister. And the watch factory knitted all the community together. Everybody was like your brother. Everybody would help everybody. In fact, everybody would help anybody that needed help outside of the factory. It was, it was a family. And the family atmosphere at the factory spilled over to the community at large. In 1956, Elgin was one of 11 cities chosen for the prestigious All-America City designation. Probably is not unwarranted here to, to bring up a, a notion again that, that academics talk about today, which is that of social capital. I mean, it, it's an imprint of uh, commonly held uh, heritage, in fact. That's what a social capital is, <laughs> in, in, in a way, which is made of uh, trust, values of solidarity, people helping or being ready to help each other as neighbors, as, as customers in stores and so on, as, as co-workers. And all of these traits, I think, are very distinctly there in Elgin, yeah, and can be clearly detected, yeah. By the late 1950s, the jeweled watch industry was falling apart. Waltham had already filed for bankruptcy and closed its factory. Elgin, which was a more sound company financially, uh, began efforts to diversify in the 1950s and move away from watch production as its sole source of income. The trouble was that they were diversifying into industries that were soon or also under attack from foreign competition. At that point in time, all the employees all of the employees from top management all the way down had taken a 10% wage cut because already they were starting to feel the brunt of the economies of the foreign market and the environment of the cost of manufacturing even in the United States was becoming a key issue. Losses mounted and the company shut down the observatory publication of the watchword magazine was stopped. Then the Lincoln plant closed, and finally, the Watchmakers College. Despite the cost-cutting efforts, the company posted a loss of $2.4 million in 1958. By the early 1960s, the Elgin National Watch Company was in disarray. They used to be a $100 million a year company. And after the 50s, it started to go down and down and down. They couldn't compete, could not compete. They could not meet the challenge of whole new ways of manufacturing watches. And there was so, the tail end of it, there was so much fighting going on, stockholders, and there was mass confusion. You really didn't know who to believe. And so it gave you a real good sense of insecurity because they were bringing in presidents out of New York City or wherever constantly trying to give it the boost that it was going to need and there was the rumors going around about Elgin, South Carolina and moving things there. In a last ditch effort to cut labor costs, the Elgin National Watch Company opened a plant in Blaney, South Carolina which changed its name to Elgin, South Carolina. They trained workers in assembling watches. It was primarily an assembly plant. And the watches were sent back to Elgin to be cased and shipped out. 
but it didn't work. The primary object, of course, was to capitalize on a lower wage level in South Carolina than in Illinois. The Elgin plant continued to operate in support of the new factory in South Carolina. But as the company marked its 100th anniversary in 1964, only 900 employees were left in Elgin. And the following year, the company sold the old factory. In the early summer of 1966, wrecking crews began dismantling the plant. Working from back to front, they demolished the building. One by one, sections collapsed until only the tower remained. A sad day of my life was to see the tower come down. In fact, even now, when I see pictures of it once in a while, it kind of turns my heart that to, to something so important could just disappear that fast. It was a symbol of Elgin, it was a symbol of growth, it was a symbol of what could be done. The uh, nature of, of Elgin changed after that. It must have been a big blow to the community seeing almost a parent die because that was what provided your daily bread. That's what brought food to your family. That's what brought a livelihood to your family. I think the community, just emotionally, uh, was affected in terms of what the factory meant to us. It was such a, it, li it literally was Elgin to many people. It was a world-renowned factory, and uh, uh, it, it was no longer here. It must have had a very severe in, in impact on, um, even on the psyche of, of the community. Uh, however, uh, not a devastating impact. Um, because uh, here we are, you know, uh, uh, several decades later, and here is a, is a city that has shown its ability to look ahead, uh, to look at the future, and to build on, on the strengths that the past has left. And the greatest strength for this community is really the social cohesiveness. That's why it has the ability to adapt and to rethink of itself. and. Uh, um, articulate a new vision, and I think this is being done, and it's quite uh, remarkable. In June of 2002, the city of Elgin completed phase one in its downtown revitalization plan, a $5.2 million renovation of Walton Island. Today marks the beginning of our efforts to reclaim the Fox River for public use and enjoyment and to stimulate economic and redevelopment of our center city. Shortly thereafter, the city received its second All-America City designation. But much of the success can be traced back to an effort that began 10 years earlier. After seeing downtown suffer through nearly two decades of deterioration, Mayor George Vandevoord led a campaign to bring a riverboat casino to Elgin. Convinced that the future of downtown hinged on the riverboat, Van de Voort appeared before the Illinois Gaming Board to state his case. I love my town. I have witnessed a once thriving downtown die. We, of course, are thinking people and have made many attempts to revive our downtown Sadly, I won't recount them all, but sadly, they have all failed. And it's my belief this is our last best chance to revive our old city and build anew. 
Van de Voorde was successful in securing the last gaming license in Illinois. In July of 1994, thousands turned out to see the launch of the Grand Victoria Riverboat Casino, just a block from the old watch factory site. The Grand Victoria, much like the watch company, has fueled Elgin's economy, helping to turn the master plan from a dream to a reality. There is no question that the Grand Victoria has provided a huge lift to Elgin, and that in many ways was driven by the community. Uh, George Vandervoort and, and his team of, of uh, local uh, residents, citizens that were involved in that process, demanded the council at the time to set standards for the investment of those dollars. And that investment required that that council and future councils limit the investment of those dollars to capital and one-time improvements, one-time capital expenses that change the community forever because those are the things that the community can do to set the stage for change. Today, Elgin's downtown is at the center of yet another renaissance. Building facade programs and streetscape improvements have spurred private investment. Soon, a new recreational facility will open, along with a new library, and work has already begun on Festival Park, a grand public space in the heart of Elgin's downtown. I think a lot of this resilience on the part of Elgin's uh, residents and, and leaders has to do with the history of the place, um, going back to the 19th century. And, uh, the the uh, centrality, in a way, that the, the uh, watch factory had in the life of the community. And so there was this kind of in, uh, relationship between the owners <laughs> of, of the factory all through the history of the city and the residents, a, very, a, a par mutual partnership, in a way. And I think that builds a lot of, uh, of uh, social cohesion you know, within a community and strengthens a community. We continue to hear about the watch factory and how great it was for the community. And no doubt it, it provided great vibrancy for the community and a place for the community in history and a place for the community on the globe. But the residual of all this is the people still remain. The people that built that factory, their spirit still lives. And that's the exciting part. And that's what's really fueling, in many ways, our resurgence, our revitalization, our comeback, if you will. And that is the legacy of the Watch Factory. And the beauty is we have not at all forgotten our history or where we came from. And we embrace it, we appreciate it, and we remember it and we move on. And that's where we are today. We're very much moving forward and, and thinking forward.